آسمون وحشتی ما سفر تانه شرم دی کابوس شرم دی افسوس شرم دی رنج Ciao, bella, ciao, bella, ciao, ciao, ciao Mi pare un dejo Io ce matto Io che mi voglio di mio Io amo voglia Io amo tanto E mi piori un to' fardo Deve non sei tu Da se doi mo Bella, ciao, bella, ciao, bella, ciao, ciao, ciao Io amo voglia Hamatan yo ruzen yo shbe farda mi parim de khom ye shmaso ya ke me ayadem yo khakei gana mi ne khabu khoshe ye khasm men tu tashne ye baruna aqim Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Dear friends, welcome to our panel on the Iranian protests. Uh, my name is Yas Ali Zadeh, and I am the coordinator of Persian program at the Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU. As you know, this panel was rather urgently organized because we at um, Iranian Studies Initiative and Kavortan Center at NYU thought that our community needs to learn more about the protests from a historical, literary, and judicial perspective. My sincerest thanks to our panelists for accepting our invitation. And of course, I need to mention a few names without whom this panel would have never been. Mohammed Bazi, the director of Kabortian Center for Near Eastern Studies. Ali Mirsepasi, the director of Iranian Studies Initiative at NYU. Arang Kishavarzian, our chair at Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. Fidel Harfouche, Kivo's Communication and Program Coordinator, and Dylan Tosinski, our Graduate Assistant. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and I'm, uh, we, I'm going to start with Moniru. Moniru Ravanipur is an esteemed Iranian author living in Nevada, United States. She has been writing a large span of genres from children's stories to short stories to novels and even screenplays. Her short stories and um, uh, writing has been, have been translated to different languages and she has been published in Pan America, World Literature Today, Consequence Magazine. She has had speeches all across American universities and, uh, and the world, but her writing is banned in Iran. And um, it's, I think, I, I would like to mention that um, Muniru's family uh, has been persecuted by the Iranian regime. She, um, her brother was executed. So she is like the epitome of um, the Iranian uh, resistance um, uh, to, to me and to the Iranian community. Um, Moniru is going to present on the metaphoric, symbolic, and mythical imagery and uh, images and messages within this uprising. Um, she's going to talk about that, that threat, that epic threat that connects these 
uh, the uprising and the actions of these women on the streets to the mythical heroines of um, Persian mythology and poetry. Our second speaker, our second panelist is Hamide Saberi. Hamide is a PhD candidate in global history of empires uh, at University of Torino in Italy. She studied also in Iran. She studied the history of Islamic culture and civilization in Iran and that got another master's degree. And right now she's writing her dissertation. Hamide is uh, following the thread of feminist movements in modern Iran and surprises us with the rich history that is the base for this truly modern uprising. And finally, our, our last panelist is uh, Nada Bulurchi. Nada is the Associate Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Rutgers, New Brunswick, where she teaches on the modern Middle East. She has a book coming on the transformative discourse on Iran as sacred across political and religious spectra. Um, Nada will conclude our panel with a brief summary of where the revolutionary protests stand, the actions taken by the international community, and what other steps, legal and otherwise, um, can be taken. Um, Iran, and I, I would like to give a kind of a very brief summary before we start or introduction. Uh, I would call it a lament to, to be truthful before we start a panelist to speak. Iran is a vast country with majestic mountains and mesmerizing terrains, a nation of many ethnicities and multitudes of languages and cultures. Iran, however, is not a still life painting and neither are Iranians black dots in the distance of a photo of a turquoise mosque fixated in the Western imagination. The other day, a student writing an article on Iran asked me, what is Iranian culture? And my answer was, I can only trust what my culture is. The rest is what I read and what I read about, what I see, what I hear, what I taste, and even what I smell. I'm aware that my Iranian culture is first and foremost a communicative culture, a term that Jan Asman coined in comparison to collective culture or collective memory. The communicative culture of a group spans roughly around three or four generations. And because it is local and oral, it is communicative, it is subjective, it is prone to being contested and disputed and even banned. That is why competitive stories about a group of people may simultaneously exist. But the question is how and whose culture becomes the staple of a people? You know, the staple that shows up on the cover of most textbooks about Iran on the side of the border in America. What really is that culture, that, that snapshot of uh, the thing that I can explain to my students to be the culture of Iran? Here come all the images on the covers of all college textbooks. Um, and most of them usually show Iran as a, a country of intricately designed ceramics with one or two women far, far in the background in black chadors maybe. The collective culture of a country is ancient. It is the horizon, it is in the distance. The collective culture does bind a people together. It does bind Iranians together through grand experiences. But also this collective culture, collective memory has normative power and it easily becomes performative and hegemonic. So much so that it's, it can even devour the people it can silence the communicative culture and it becomes the official story sometimes. And of course, when we talk about stories, there's no story unless that story is told to others or sold to others. With the democratizing effects of digital media and public journalism, such static imaginaries, that you know, grand narrative or that collective culture starts to be ripped open by momentary sparks of a different Iran that is um, occupying a space. But unlike traditional stories about Iran, this new story invites the other, the audience, to be part of the heteroglossy of cultural expressions, political choices, and philosophical debates. We owe the change in world's response to the Iranian protests to two things, I believe. The first is the American demand for social justice and in America and in the world. 
and the second to social media. The Black Lives Matter movement sparked for fairness, inclusion, and transparency, trained a new generation in America. This generation holds the vigil for Mahsa. This generation demands their deans and provosts to make public announcements condemning the Iranian regime. This generation proposes solutions that is not afraid to fail. This is the multitasking generation of doers who fully understand the urgent actions of their brothers and sisters in Iran. So dear friends, if I had told my students up to Mahsa's death that the culture of Iran was crystallized in Navid Afkari, and whoever asked why I would say, just listen to his final words in prison, I now say the culture of Iran crystallizes in Mahsa Amini. As simple as that. The Iranian culture is a young, brave man or woman in chains or in hiding. But that is partly the goal of this short introduction. There is urgency to understand this culture, and it is far from the still life of a turquoise dome. The Iranian culture is physically gorgeous. Yes, physiognomy matters at this time. Beauty matters at this time. This young culture is in chains, is in hiding, and deserves attention now, or it will be too late. America has been moving fast forward with regards to local social justice. But with regards to global social justice, it lags behind. Being aware of their own status within a white colonialist discourse is a great starting point. Making local social justice global social justice should be the end goal. We need to break the phenomenological homogeneity with which Iran has been traditionally presumed and defined. Enough of the one regime of truth for us, enough of the neo-orientalist quiet gaze upon Iranians. Uh, Edward Said calls such an approach the uh, quote unquote timeless eternal. Homi Baba is right when he says, quote, when Western rationalism preserves the boundaries of sense to itself, end quote. Its attitude towards the East is synchronic essentialism. When I, and as an Iranian, I felt that for a long time making the unhappy Easterner, the intellectual, the artist, the student feel apologetic for deconstructing the petty image that has been made of us. We do think within the parameters of cultural discourses defined by the political market. As Jameson says, it is almost impossible to imagine what is not defined. It takes a lot of effort to break, break through and accuse the culture that we are sold as a state-sponsored derivative of political hegemony. The voice and hair of Iranian women, for example, it's been illegal for 43 years per law, but it's very easy to call it culture. So when we on this side of the waters are defending what we suppose is culture, we want to make sure that we are not defending that the, na the narrative that is sold to us by the uh, in human law as culture, the forged, the manufactured consent. We may mistake law for culture, hence we may mistakenly defend the law in the name of cultural appreciation. Who has been the salesperson of this law wrapped in culture, you might ask? You know, the, the, the ones who sell this law, they have prestige, they have power, they have tools of production. They're very, very difficult to denounce. And here again, is social media and public journalism that comes to the rescue of the young Iranian people. Here, the community of culture becomes the matter. Ask anyone with prison experience in Iran, including Munir herself, and they will tell you that torture and forced confessions are a norm. But they're not normal. They're not normal for you. They're not normal for us. And unless we object to the quote unquote, your normal is not my normal fallacy, when it comes to basic human rights, we will have to continue bringing grotesque reasonings for our cheating on this quiz of conscience and be the outsiders silently looking in at this national uprising, which I'm proud to call a revolution. Um, I'm ending my introduction and I am opening the floor to Moniru to, thank you so much. <laughs> to speak for us and share. Thank you, thank you so much. And hello everybody, I have to share my PowerPoint. Oh. 
Okay. I am giving you a summary of what I wrote about this revolution. I mean, I will tell you about golden part of our culture. This Persian revolution is our renaissance and came up from previous movements, conquesting Iran by Arabs 1400 years ago led to many social changes. They came with their famous slogan, Muslims are equal before Allah or God. But the reality was completely different. They abused their power as usual and wrote it up everything. They took women as an in, in enslaved person. Many political and religious group rose up. Many poets started writing. Pe people started to confront them. Groups and, and movements confronted hypocritical ascetic. I want to show how three poetry books are hugely affecting this Iranian revolution. The first one is Shahnameh, the second one is Rubaiyat Khayyam, and the third one is Divan Hafiz. Shahnameh. The Book of Kings, or Shahnameh, is a long epic poem written by Ferdowsi between 977 and 1010 CE, and is the national epic of Iran. It tells mainly the mythical and historical past of Persian Empire, from the world's creation until the Muslim conquested in the seventh century. Ferdowsi, by writing this book, save our language and nation. Girls who are protesting on the street use and show many symbols of our mythology and culture, even though they might not have read the book. Yisuburan or cutting hair. Cutting hair is still a ritual. When a woman wants to fight or show her fury or wants to start a new life and new things, she cuts her hair and uses it as a belt or send it to her loved ones. Using hair as a belt gives them power. In our culture, hair is not for hiding. It is for protesting, loving, or starting a new life, or escaping from prison. In our fairy tale, they escape, many girls escape from prison by simply using their hairs as rope. And hijab is not. Persian culture court. Ferdowsi belonged to a former family where, we, where women worked side by side with men. He knew that hijab has not belonged to these women. Hijab belonged to women from the higher class. But even the, in the higher class, women wore the scarves, but it was completely different from what we see today. They wrote, they wore tool head scraps in a special ceremony and the head covering was not black. Instead, it was colorful depending on events and black almost came with Muslim attack. 
It is not Iranian color. Even in grief, people wore white clothes. Protesting by the fire. Protesting by the fire and throwing a scarf into a fire is not a simple act. It comes from our ethnic unconscious. For me, as a writer, a scarf is a sign of tradition. It is a metaphor. Fire is symbol of Persian culture. We know about Zoroastrian religious. So setting a scarf on a fire has a, a special and powerful message for the nation. It says that the immense fire in the fire temple in Persia was turned off by itself when the Arab invaded the country. The guests lit a small bonfire all around the country, all around the cities. What do these many bonfires resemble? Are they together making the same fire temple that was turned off 1400 years ago? Let's talk about their slogan. Girls chanted Khamenei Zahat Mikashamat Zir Khat. Zahab is the most brutal king in Shahnameh. He has two snakes on his shoulder, and every day these snakes need to eat brain. And they kill two young people, two young girls or um, boys, and give them two brain. When they say, I will bury you, okay? You know, you can't see an Iranian who doesn't know who Zahat is, even though they don't read Shahnameh. I'm sure that most of these girls didn't read Shahnameh, but they know who Zahat is, who Kaveh Ohangar, who is Arash Kamangir. They are living with us. They are living in our heart, in our mind. They are breathing in the air, but, the most fantastic characters are Gorda Farid and other women who fight. Ferdowsi wrote about them in a time when women didn't have any right, rights as a human being. The Book of King, the Book of Kings help us to get back to ourselves to find our identity again. Giving a title like a gourd, gourd means, in Farsi means pahlavan, knight, champion, hero. Giving a title like a gourd, gourd to a woman, woman by Ferdowsi has a message to Iranian girls. So he wanted, I thought, as a, you know, I imagine that he wanted to warn the girls what, what might happen and how they have to face it with courage and bravery. I thought he saw these days when he was writing about Gorda Farid. The second poet is Khayyam. I'm sorry. <laughs> the second poet is Khayyam. 900 years ago. Nobody during his life, nobody knew that he's a poet. 
because except his friend, close friend. Because if anybody else knew about it, they reported, he reported, and hypocritical ascetics would kill him. After his death, people knew that he, is, he was a great poet. He lived, uh, he believed in living in the present. He didn't care about going to heaven or hell. He was against ascetics, constantly remind readers of how temporary life is. Dance, drink, and love each other, his message is. Enjoy and be happy if you want, if you can. There is no other word except this earthy one. These girls and these girls who are dancing, this girl who are dancing around the fire by the fire remind me a kind of Hayam Hani that it is our main ritual in South of Iran. When we face misery, or I remember when they killed my brother, everybody was very sad and we didn't know what to do. Finally, my mom say, let's have Hayam Hani. We got together in our house, in one of, in a house in Shiraz and we close every windows and doors and then start Hayam Hani. It means we start dancing and singing it, it, it lasts 23 days. It is a, a special ritual for confronting with sadness, with death, with a storm. So these girls, this is a sign of Hayam Pani. And I can say that Hayam has a huge effect on these girls, even though they didn't read his book. <clears throat> the third poet is Hafez. Hafez is the most famous poet in Iran and he's bestseller. It means Iranian by his book is poetry more than Quran. It is strange, but it is true. He lived 700 years ago. And he was born, he, he lives in an unstable, a stormy era with gov where, when government were overthrown at any moment after Mongol attacked uh, Shiraz. The, he has one book, Divan Hafez, we say Hafez or Divan Hafez, is not only poem, but it has also permeate, permeated our life and tradition. We, we celebrate with, with his book. The, the first moment of New Year, we read his book, the first night of uh, winter, Shabi Yalda, we read his book and we horoscope for everything. We ask him, we, we kiss his book more than Quran and ask him to show us our future, to show our way. And I wanted to say a personal story I had a boyfriend and my boyfriend went to England and I was very upset and I didn't know what to do. And I was in one of my friend's house and she told me why you didn't, why you don't want us coffees. And we took coffees, I kissed coffees and I asked, I asked her, him, what would happen to my life? Where, where is he? And open the when I open the book, he say, Yusuf Gongashte Bazayat Bikan on Ramakon. Yusuf will come back to your 
city, don't be worried. And then finally he came and I am right now living with my ex-boyfriend, he's my husband. <laughs> okay, and then we buy office as a gift for our friends. We use it in our marriage and wedding ceremony. And even in friendly gathering, we read Hafez. You can find one Irani Iranian that he or she doesn't read Hafez one time per year. He worked at, as, a as a baker in a bakery. He was born in Shiraz and spent his free time studying in a Quran schools near the bakery. He recited the Quran with 14 narrations. At the beginning of his youth, he entered the Sufi group with the hope of finding his path, path and went to monastery, went to Khanaha. We say Khanaha, monastery. He was not self denying, he was not anti life. He believed we in social criticism. After observing the inconsistencies and ambivalence between the ascetics' words and actions, he left them. Zahedan kin khutbe dar mehrab man bar mikonan, chun be khalwat miravan. On I am sorry, I can't tell you the Zahedan is ascetic who tell in public a beautiful things and preach when they go to their when they go to their private place, they do another things. I, I, I may, maybe Yossi can can help me to translate yes. it. Zahedan. Yeah, that was perfect. That was perfect. Thought, okay, thank you, thank you. And you know, and then. Okay, he left monastery after he left monastery and started criticizing the Sufis. What he saw was not independence, virtue, purity, or piety or piety. Instead, he saw Russian eaters, supplicant of the rulers of the time, prejudice narrowness, superstitions, and incompetence, and cultism. Hafez start attacking, attack, okay, this beautiful man, Hafez attacked this hypocritical ascetic, ascetic. In his book, in his beautiful book, Divan Hafez, there is two negative characters. One is Muhtasab. It's revolutionary God. You, you, you see in the news, in videos, that how they, they, they arrest people, how they beat them, how, how they attack them. Revolutionary God or morality. Police is Muhtasab. And these guys are Zahid, ascetics. He is not against Zahed. He's against hypocritical Zahed. Zahed Riyai, that he has double face. Okay. For knowing about Zahed, we can look at the situation in Iran. Look at Khamenei. Khamenei doesn't want to see reality. Or reality is different for him. He pretends that he avoid worldly pleasures. He is close to God. He is representative of God on earth. He is arrogant and proud of himself. All those mullahs, this, this one, who force women to wear hijab are hypocritic. They deny killing a student. They, and they, they, killing a student and girls. They deny raping people in their prison. They always blame United States as a Satan, great Satan and Israel for everything. Okay. The 
This is Muhtasab. Those who are right now in, uh, in Iran street and arresting people and shoot people and kill people. This one is a Muhtasab during Hafez era. At least he, he wear a colorful clothes, not wear black. But this one is worse than them. Okay. Now I am going to I am going to show you who is rent. Because you know what? The beauty of Divana Office is this. He created a wonderful character. He put rent against aesthetic. And these are rent. These beautiful girls who are protesting on a street in Iran are rent. Let me tell you about a perfect man, a perfect human being. Hafiz believes on perfect human being. He say Adam or Eve is the most perfect human being in the world because they reject be having a boring life in garden or in heaven. They wanted to have to experience. They wanted to go and search and experience everything. Love, sadness, happiness, misery. They wanted to follow their feeling and emotion. Hafiz respect perfect human being. And he say, Rand is a perfect human being. He say that angels are not perfect and are not respectful. They are foolish. They don't have any experience. You are perfect if you if you experience victory and failure, both of them. And so these girls are then, when I was watching those girls on the street and I watched video, I just, I, 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 I think that they are the modern Ren. They want to live their life. They don't want to go to hell or they don't go, want to go to heaven. They don't care about this stuff. They want to fall in love, hug those people who, who hug each other, have fun with each other, work. They want to be happy. They want to be sad. They want to be a human being. They don't want to follow the order, the Sharia law. They are from another century. Hafiz was from few was from future. Hafiz is not from the past. It is our future, and they are our from our future. They are showing us our future. So let me see if, of course, Hafiz. Talk about harabati. These girls are ayar. These girls are not only rent, also rent harabati. So a group of people during the, the, the Hafez era wanted to drink or be happy or make whatever friendship has, they wanted to have relationship with their friends. They wanted to drink and the ascetics didn't let them to stay in the city. They find a ruined buildings and went there. After a while, that place become a, become a center of gathering. And Hafez put this Kharabat Kade, Kharabati, Kharabat Kade in front of mosque. mosque. He said that if you go to Harabat, 
it is much better to go to Mars when there is a hypocritical ascetic there. Our fight always was and is and will be with Zahed Riyai, with hypocritical ascetic. Okay. And then the last, the last. Now, the final question and final word is really who is Zahed? When I say Zahed, am I talking only about religious people, this calorie, in beautiful calorie? No. In this revolution, all conservatives and mullahs are ascetic or zahir. After our historical and cultural experience, we know Zahed is not trustworthy. You can't believe him, he's a liar. He is double faced and has double standard. He says something in public and act the opposite in private. He's pretending. A hypocritical ascetic doesn't believe in quality and justice. He considers himself superior and closer to God. He thinks being close to God gives him authority over everyone's lives and property. This uprising doesn't defy only religious mullah. Be careful. I want this is this is very important. This uprising doesn't define only religious mullah. Everybody who used and abused power to, to reach personal goal could be Zahed. I can be Zahed if I am a writer and I use abuse my fame, I could be Zahed, okay? A journalist who used the demonstration as a ladder to get power, or an artist that pretended she was an activist or cared about human rights, but she only cared about herself. Everybody with a double face, one for public and one for private, is a hypocritical ascetic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monir John. I think there's one uh, beautiful uh, sl uh, slide left that we could look at. The last one, number 14. Oh, 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 I am, I am sorry. Yeah, this is- I love that. This picture. is Renz, yeah, this is Renz, yeah. yeah. This is- Rende Karabati, Rende Kalanda, Rende, oh my God. You know, Hafiz has, has a beautiful definition for these girls and young boys. And I am working on my paper. I will publish it on my newsletter very soon. Every Sunday I publish in English. <laughs> Do, oh, those friends who wants to follow and read the complete, um, complete article can, it is, free, it is free, you can register by putting your email on this. I am registered. So I'm okay. gonna make sure that everybody else does too. Thank you so much, Monir John. I, I, it was, it was wonderful. It was it was really beautiful. It was very powerful, and it is really what we need. It's kind of making sense of this uprising and how it is part of our, you know, uh, part of our kind of heritage, part of our part of our being, part of, part of being Iranian, part of being Persian, uh, part of us. Thank you so much. So we're going to move on to Hamide, and we can't wait to hear Hamide's take on this. Um, but while Moniru focused on the literary aspects and the epic aspects of this uh, revolution, Hamide is looking at um, the history of feminism in um, modern Iran in the past hundred years or so. Thank you so much, Hamide John. Thank you so much, Yasanzis. Also, Moniru Jun, I have to say. I mean, I, I can uh, listen to you forever. So. Thank you so much, my love. <laughs> In Iran and, you know, making sense uh, from what's happening today in Iran and 
connecting it, matching it with uh, our heritage is something, you know, we need to hear because uh, I think it's empowering us to keep going, you know, because we feel like it's coming from somewhere and we, we need to protect from something, not just ourselves, but our culture as well. So thank you so much and hello to everyone. Um, well, uh, I have to say, um, these days it's uh, very difficult days and uh, talking about what's happening in Iran and uh, uh, which is very important, but sometimes it's very, very hard uh, because, uh, you know, the emotional situation that we are all going through. Uh, as you all know, uh, this uprising uh, has been started by women and uh, women in Iran are uh, the, in the front uh, lines of fighting with this brutal and outrageous regime. But uh, I, I, I love to uh, emphasize in the fact that uh, women's movement, as you all know, has a very deep historical background in Iran, and we can uh, trace the line uh, from a constitutional revolution, like in 19, uh, 1905, uh, that women has officially started to, by making, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, let's say, movement uh, from a small association to, uh, to, to personal fighting, uh, to stand against this um, religious patriarchal system. And, uh, you know, for instance, and, and, and it's important to know that women in Iran historically have all be, always been radical in facing with this patriarchal religious system. For instance, just uh, some uh, example we can um, uh, mention to the documents that telling us uh, that at the end of the Gajar dynasty uh, and also during the constitution revolution, uh, uh, women's, uh, women start to fight against forced hijab. And not just uh, those women, those known women that we heard of, like Tahir Ghoratul Ain, who removed her face veil, or Shahnaza Azad, who called the hijab a superstition in uh, her magazine in 1920, or Fakhra uh, Parsa, another journalist who uh, invited women in her art in her article to remove their hijab in 1921. Or Sediqa Dolat who is a very well-known uh, feminist, uh, you know, one of the pioneer who introduced hijab as the main reason for eliminating women from the society. But also, uh, anonymous women uh, who actually demonstrated on the on the street, shouting that the uh, Constitution Revolution promised us as a women the freedom, so we should be free from uh, religion. But you know, most of the time we don't see or hear these voices. Uh, in the history, since, as you know, history is written by men, about men, and for men, for men mostly. And we cannot hear these voices, uh, women's voices, and resistance against the patriarchal system, more often. Rather, patriarchal system is the one trying to minimize women's agency because it's easier in this case to oppress and disempower women and presenting women as the weaker sex. As uh, Myra Sadker said, each time a girl opens a book and reads a women womenless history, she learns is she is worthless. So it's important to emphasize that the uh, religious patriarchal system 
despite repressing women's voices in uh, demanding about uh, their own rights, has always also ignored the significant role of women in serving the nation. And we cannot, you know, going through the history, we cannot see that uh, admitting that how much women's agency was important through the history for making and serving the nation. In another word, the attempt of the patriarchal system in Iran, religious patriarchal system in Iran, has always been not to talk about women's powerful impact in developing society. For instance, women's role during the Constitution Revolution, including participating in organized street protests, uh, joining underground activities against foreign forces, and etc. However, it's not just the religious patriarchal system that has banded women to access their basic rights, rather the majority of secular males in Iran have always taken the same position as religious male in regard to women's rights. That's why I argue that Iranian women during the history had to deal with two or double patriarchy, religious patriarchal system and secular patriarchal system. These both fight for gaining power against each other, but at the same time, they both are agree in eliminating, el eliminating women from the power system. I wanna uh, connect this argument with what's happening today in Iran in women's uh, uprising. Because as you know, in the this very historical moment, uh, and in all the historical moments in the uh, during uh, Persian history, like Constitutional Revolution or the uh, Tabaku protest in 1908, the patriarchal system has always used women's agency to get to its political aim. But right after each revolution, the result was upsetting for women. Even though women has always did their share or their part for the nation, they could, ha they could have never get any fair share in the power system and the history and the experience of women in all different parts of the world is informing us that if we do not get our share in power system, we cannot change women's situation in society. And we will be just handed like between two uh, different patriarchal system. Sometimes we might be lucky and uh, be handed to the good face of patriarchal system. And like during the Pahlavi, uh, women had some rights, you know, uh, in the constitutional law comparing to the Islamic regime, or we might be handed to the bad face, let's say, uh, of patriarchal system, which is religious patriarchal system that and uh, ruling uh, be ruled by Sharia law that deny all the women's rights in all different uh, aspects of our life. Uh, and you know, if we uh, if we be controlled by secular uh, secular patriarchal system, in this system, wise men mostly, uh, give themselves the permission to decide for us, I mean, uh, for women. And it's from their perspe perspective or their understanding to say what's good for us. And 
if a woman in that, uh, let's say, a structure or system get to the power, it's not something that's coming from women themselves, but it's something, it's the power that has been given by men to women. And that's why it, they, it can be changed or influenced very fast as we experience how fast they could actually take so many rights uh, and, and you know change the women's situation from Pahlavi to uh, you know Islamic regime. It was just with one fatwa, you know, just one fatwa changed the women's situation in Iran uh, completely. So that's because mostly women themselves didn't have the power in the system, the power that came uh, from women themselves, not uh, a power that has been given by a man. And it's very important to uh, understand this uh, point of view because since the patriarchal system is deeply rooted in the society like Middle Eastern society, we should be very careful because they might use women's agency and a slogan like women like freedom, but eliminating women, uh, women's right right after. I mean, what we have been experienced till now. So my understanding is that we should be aware of uh, um, in, in the current situation, in the current battle that we are dealing with. The regime as a religious patriarchal system is one of our enemy. And another enemy for us as a women, Iranian women, is the sec secular patriarchal system who are planning for political future in Iran. Why it's important? It's because as Mona Al-Tahavi emphasized, if in the Middle East, we do not do the sexual revolution along with social revolution, we cannot get to the democracy. Indeed, sexual revolution can target all kinds of discrimination, including gender, ethnic, religious minorities, and also even those who are facing the discrimination uh, because of their physical disability. So it's important to know that when we, one of our slogan is women, women's right is uh, let's say touching or pointing to the women is because if we get to the point that we meet uh, the women's right in our constitutional law, it means that we target all the uh, discri uh, discriminatory structure in the whole. So it's important to hold to that, uh, that uh, slogan as women, life, freedom. So in my opinion, it's very important to uh, stay uh, also crystal clear about what we want as a women in the future Iran, because if we if we go back to the uh, you know what we have been experienced before and all the demonstration that has been taken by women in the last generation and how they try to change the structure and they have been repressed because you know, the patriarchal, religious patriarchal system has the power, has the access to the sources. So for, for this patriarchal system, it's very easy to ignore women, you know, and the secular, secular patriarchal system is very smart in taking the agency of women and then after meeting what they want, after gaining what they want, you know, eliminate women or ignore women, uh, you know, afterward. So 
now that we are in the uh, let's say uh, in in the during the the process of uh, revol women's revolution it's very important to use our experience and remind ourselves that we as a women have to be crystal clear about what we want in the future iran and this is this is our duty today, as I uh, argue, to say that we want the same share in politics, in the wealth of the nation, and in the uh, and the same participation in every aspect of ruling our country, including writing the constitutional law, because if uh, they get uh, to the point that's, uh, you know, uh, saying that uh, uh, stopping us from uh, uh, raising our voice about what we want in this stage, we should be sure that they can actually uh, hide us or shut us down after the revolution. So it's very important in this stage to be very clear that this revolution, it's not gonna actually um, uh, experience, uh, uh, you know, uh, what happened to us before, but we want to make sure that in this uh, current experience, we will not lose any, uh, actually any rights in our future Iran. And uh, also we need to make sure that nothing and no one will push us backward. And based on our, our experience, any retreat is going to hurt us, you know, because we have we have heard so many times from uh, as you know the patriarchal system has a very different and tricky discourse to hide our voices so we should be aware that in this time uh, it shouldn't be any let's say a retreat uh, in our negotiating with the patriarchal system uh, and you, you know, because I, I, we all heard that during the uprising uh, and after the um, uh, when the slogan of women life freedom gets uh, got very popular, there were some uh, people trying to you know add something to this slogan. But this is important to know that anything that can affect or influence this slogan to, uh, let's say, uh, to, um, uh, how do you say, to take the, um, uh, this, uh, the important uh, less than it is, it's actually a trick for us to change the road and actually tricking what we want uh, in our future. So, the, uh, the very last point is that this uh, slogan can help us to guide the, all the political ideology in tomorrow's Iran and uh, present to them what we want and what we are looking for tomorrow's so they can be uh, actually very aware of how they should handle uh, their political party. And uh, as a suggestion, I think in this very historical moment, it's very important for uh, politician, women's politicians in Iran to get an action and try to um, do something like uh, uh, arranging a women's party in sense to uh, support our political uh, position in tomorrow's Iran. Grazie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hamida. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed your talk and I'm sure everybody else as well. Uh, very interesting points that you um, uh, talked about and definitely um, 
food for thought um, that this is we don't want this moment to be a fleeting moment we want this to be uh, to be the basis for a future that we are building and uh, so uh, this this kind of the feminist idea if we could or woman's idea whatever you want to call it um, is, is important to the future of Iran and um, um, I would think 43 years and counting, but as you said, more than that, a century, longer than a century and counting. So um, thank you so much again. We'll definitely go back um, to your uh, presentation and also to Moniru after we have Nada speaking. And definitely people will have questions and we're gonna have a dialogue on what you said and what Moniru presented. Thank you again, Hamide. So, before further ado, we'll move on to um, Nadal Balurchi. Nadal, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Yas, and to NYU and the Kevorkian Center and the Iranian Studies Unit. Uh, it is a pleasure to be back, uh, even under these circumstances. Um, Today, I'm just largely uh, wanted to sort of summarize where we are in the in in terms of um, the the things that have been done within the international community over the course of the last five weeks, and and in particular maybe the last week, and what's possible, um, and a little bit more um, in terms of um, where things can go. Um, and I think, as most people know, the first two weeks of as these protests were ongoing. Um, with Iranian women and their allies fighting and arguing and dying in the streets and jails across Iran, the international community was largely silent and sat on the sides. Um, and this was despite the obligations of the Islamic Republic under the International Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights, which is a multilateral treaty uh, that does uh, that the Islamic Republic has signed on to. And I think it's important um, when we're talking about the international community to remind um, individuals and uh, governments uh, of particular laws. And so what we have is, and this is not exhaustive at all by any means, I've just picked one treaty um, and a couple of its articles to sort of press uh, the extent to which uh, there are violations. Uh, for example, Article 21, under Article 21, Tehran should halt the use of lethal force and unlawful suppression, uh, as well as violence against protesters. Uh, under Article 7, it should stop subjugating its citizenry to torture and cruel and unusual and degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, I would argue that this, of course, includes the re-education centers that uh, individuals under the age of 18 are being sent to, as admitted by the Minister of Education himself. Articles 10 and 14 uh, call for Tehran to ensure fair and lawful treatment of detainees as well as accused persons. So this means that even if the Iranian government is saying that the protests are not protests, but they're actually riots um, that are incited by individuals uh, using illegal means, including Molotov cocktails, or that they are otherwise attacking military institutions, um, and therefore the Islamic Republic, in theory, is justified in its actions, right? Articles 10 and 14 would say that even though those might be accused persons, you are to treat them fairly and lawfully. Uh, Article 9 would suggest that Iran stop its unlawful and arbitrary arrests and detentions. This includes the arbitrary arrests and detentions of over 70 lawyers, human rights activists, human rights defenders, as well as artists and journalists. Article 19 would suggest stop interference and attacks on expression of thought and conscience. Again, peaceful demonstrations, peaceful statements, and peaceful nonviolent actions are protected by Article 19. Um, so in these six weeks, but in particular those first two weeks, the international community didn't take steps on the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. Um, and uh, what we did see is a very nominal step by the Biden administration, um, again, sanctioning Iran. Uh, it sanctioned seven individuals uh, senior individuals in security organizations who probably have not left Iran 
recently and probably will not leave Iran recently. Um, so again, I called these sanctions of seven individuals nominal. They are individuals at the morality, five institutions, the morality police, the Ministry of Intelligence and Security, the Army's ground forces, the Basij resistance forces, and then police forces um, have been sanctioned. And so as the weeks have gone by and the numbers have continued to climb, uh, estimates on the low end suggest now that more than 240 Iranians have been killed, over 1,000 injured, 5,000 arrested, and 23 children murdered. Um, and at the end of September, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, uh, basically all he did was call on Iran to stop, quote, using disproportionate force and to allow an investigation into Gina Massa Amini's death. In the last two weeks, uh, there have, because of uh, human rights activists, social activists, Iranian activists, more pressure on international community, the Biden administration, the Canadian government, um, as well as Northern European and Scandinavian countries, um, particularly their women expressing solidarity with the women of Iran uh, who are demanding their human rights. Um, and in particular, the rights of children um, so as mass protests have increased um, and the arrests have increased uh, last week, uh, if you did not hear, there were protests in Erdebil um, because uh, there was the attempt and an actual movement of school aged children, uh, the forcible movement of those children from their schools to go and uh, sing to the leader of the country at the time being. And in the protests, one 16-year-old uh, girl uh, was murdered. And subsequently, her name, Astra Panahi, um, died in a hospital from the injuries she sustained. And a man claiming to be her uncle appeared on state TV, uh, saying that she died from an inherited heart condition. Um, famous Iranian soccer player Ali Dai has come out and said he thoroughly disagrees with that, does not believe it. Um, and so there is now a soccer, um, there's been an ongoing soccer sort of conflict there. As a result um, of uh, so much activism on the part of Iranians, heritage Iranians, Iranians in the diaspora, and particularly in technology, um, as well as across uh, different other professions, law and academia, the United Nations Human Rights Office has come out and made a statement um, through its spokesperson, uh, Ravina Shem Damasi, uh, who did say that 23 children have been killed, scores more injured by security forces using live ammunition, metal pellets, and fatal beatings, um, that schools have been raided and children arrested. Um, and she has, as the spokesperson, uh, again, reiterated um, human rights treaties that have been accepted by Islamic Republic, and that Tehran does have an obligation to protect children's right to life. It is a fundamental right accepted by the international community. There is no cultural exemption on that, or what other phrase anyone wants to use. Um, and that under its obligations, she continues in her statement from the UN Human Rights Office on uh, to say that Iran is to respect and protect the children and their right to freedom ex of expression. And again, peaceful protest. 16-year-olds uh, do not appear to be throwing anything or have guns. Um, we can talk about sort of the limitations on um, armed weaponry in Iran if you want. Um, and so, and in particular, then uh, with the what appears to be the forced uh, deportation of El Naz Rekabi from Korea back to Iran, um, the UN Human Rights uh, spokesperson has again stressed that uh, there are numerous ongoing violations, including arbitrary detention um, and violence against women for what they are wearing. Um, and she stressed in not so many words, the need for Iran to respect bodily autonomy. Um, those uh, aside, the other thing that has sort of, um, not as an aside, but in addition to what seems to be discussed a lot um, has been access to technology and how important technology and social media has been 
for um, protesters, human rights activists, human rights defenders, and how Iran has in fact blocked um, not just VPNs, which is one thing, but and not certain sites, but shut down the entire internet in Iran. And so part of the technological problem has been that private servers, um, to switch from law to technology, Private servers can uh, occasionally fill the gap, but they can't fill the gap in a total blackout. Um, mesh networks via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi can help in terms of facilitating communications that with devices that are nearby, i.e. that protesters can send messages to each other via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth if they can sort of work in these networks, but that only helps inside of a country. It doesn't help getting messages or videos outside. Um, and so I do have to bring up in this regard, um, Elon Musk and Starlink. So many people, particularly in the first month of the protests, uh, made sort of arguments that the Biden administration should allow Starlink to go to Iran. It, I'm not sure how, uh, if it hasn't been cleared, um, but there are three sort of problems with Starlink. Um, one, it's uh, 30 pounds. Starlink is a, is a large thing. So getting it into Iran is, is difficult. Um, problem number two is you have to host it. So it's visible, right, from somebody's balcony, somebody's roof, um, based on its size. So not only is that those two problems, but then three, again, legally, um, there is a, an organization, yes, uh, considered the International Telecommunication Union. And in order to host a satellite over a country, you would uh, have to have the country's permission. And this is, even if we figure out pro the solutions to one and two, um, and this is the major difference between Iran and Ukraine, is that Iran would not give permission to have satellites overhead, uh, whereas Ukraine has given permission to have satellites overhead. Um, and, and so this is right, the, the, the I see a question in sort of transnational social space. I'm not, I, based on the International Telecommunications Union, pretty sure legally um, that Iran has to give permission for those satellites to be overhead. Um, where that leaves us is, um, you know, a total blackout is very costly. It's it, 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 There's a huge uh, hit to total revenue. Um, but the problem with that is Iran is not that ingrained in, um, in terms of uh, being on the internet. It doesn't make so much of its money there. Um, and so uh, it can it can't fully continue total blackouts and, and there might be attempts at um, more at selective filtering. And so with selective filtering, that means it, that's a great opportunity for advanced VPNs um, and private servers to come into play. And really for the, the tech community, um, which is so largely composed of Iranians, Iranian heritage persons and people in the diaspora um, who have been on and, and work for Meta and Google and DigitalOcean and Apple and Amazon, um, this is a place for uh, their advancements, um, as well as um, pushing uh, on, on the legal status. And so I think the final thing I would say is uh, this past week, um, the Biden administration, or last week, um, uh, granted a general license D2. Um, and so this is a step up from the D1 license uh, that previously was sort of hard to navigate, hard to understand. Um, and under the D2 license, uh, Iranians do have increased uh, access to the internet um, through, as well as exempted services and hardware, um, in particular cloud storage programs. So if you um, can access the internet in those moments that it's not being blacked out, but filtering moments, it means that there's cloud storage out there to put photos and videos and voice messages on. Um, and, and so that there is still a mechanism for um, keeping in touch and, and that the D2 license does help, essentially can help. Um, so that is um, sort of my, where we have been um, from the silence of the international community to smaller um, steps that are helping through uh, technology and the law. Thank you so much, Nida. This was, this was such, a, such an awesome kind of culmination of our 
you know, literary, historical approaches to this protest. And it was so necessary. And I, again, I learned so much and I was jotting down all these articles. So, um, you know, let, let me start from, from the end and then go back. And then if, um, you know, the audience has questions, please, um, you know, we'll, we'll ask Dylan to let the audience ask their questions. But uh, I, I wanna go with um, Neda, what you said, because you were among the first people who actually wrote about the Iranian protests. You did it in, I think, October 1st or October 2nd in the USA Today. And so it's been a while, it's about 20 day, 20, well, yeah, 20 days since that, since that article was published. Uh, how do you see um, the response of the world community, um, legal, political, to, um, to what you wrote about in, in that day? In other words, what you're about and then what happened in the US politically, mm -hmm. um, culturally, academically, do you see the if you're writing now, would it would would it be extra things to add? Well, I thank you so much for asking um, because that article actually um, was not the full article. Um, there were uh, I will just sort of say it. USA Today asked me to give them my sources, and so that they could vet or confirm quotes that I had in that article um, from protesters. And um, uh, as a, an academic, as a lawyer, as somebody who has been on the ground and, and has fought for uh, human rights in Iran, there's absolutely no way I'm hand, handing over my sources. Um, so all the quotes from the women and men uh, who had been protesting in the two weeks prior to that October 1st article um, are not in that article. Um, and, and so there, if you think that the article is missing something or how am I making conclusionary statements, it's because the quotes were removed. Um, and I actually refused to edit it. So they edited it and sent it and asked for my approval. And I just was kind of like, that's fine. Um, so I think a, a different outlet or a, a different, um, you know, uh, their CBS News has been doing a very good job in the sense of, um, and I have uh, talked to Roxana Savary, we've exchanged particularly on the Art of Eel story. Um, I think that very much uh, since October 1st, um, there is a greater understanding for what's at risk. Um, I think that news outlets are much more sensitive and, and should be um, about protecting sources, but particularly Iranian sources at this time. Um, and that we as the, the scholars on one end who have been on the ground and in the field um, versus, or and, and with journalists who are doing the same thing, what has to be done to protect sources um, and who are right fighting uh, so much to just have their voices heard. Um, I have a panel at Rutgers that's coming up, um, and one of my protesters, I said, I you know, I'd like to invite you if you want to speak, and she is ecstatic to to be able to have that opportunity. And so for us, it's a it's a matter of technology, right? It goes back to, is the internet going to be up? Um, is are we going to have a connection? And then how do we take care of? Um, making sure she's not seen or her voice isn't recognized. Um, I think that the activists, regardless of your politics, um, so many of the activists, uh, Iranian activists, at least in the US as well as in Canada, uh, I have a, you know, a former legal associate there who's been doing phenomenal work on pushing the Canadian government um, to uh, sanction or uh, sort of withdraw their officials um, and to also push out uh, Iranian officials uh, to actually ask for the Iranian government officials um, at the highest levels to be removed and just leave uh, the sort of the bureaucratic ones, right? The lower level, the ones who would take care of visas and passports. Um, and so there has been a very much a, a push um, on how to uh, send the message that high-ranking officials, even di diplomatic ones who might otherwise whitewash what's happening, um, are not acceptable um, in sort of the Euro-American space, um, that they are complicit um, and yet to nevertheless be able to function. Um, 
So I think there's a lot that that is happening in in a good way. Um, I think some of the some of the activists may be a little bit on the other side in in terms of we women want choice, they want bodily autonomy, and that should be a broad spectrum. Um, and 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 so while I'm not one for hijab or uh, you know that's my choice. Um, so to not sort of lessen the voices, uh, I did have um, at Rutgers Law School um, from the Muslim Student Association uh, asked to make sure that women in hijab are heard and part of uh, any sort of protest. And, and, and to be very clear, I think there have been a large number of more conservative women in Iran uh, who have come out um, against what has been happening. Uh, they have come out um, against the Raisi government because they as conservative women weren't included in the government. Um, and so uh, I would uh, sort of also caution that um, the, the operative words here are choice, right? Freedom and choice and autonomy. Um, so that is kind of where I think uh, in, in a good way um, from the beginning what I was saying, so much has changed um, and uh, definitely, uh, particularly from New York to DC, and I think increasingly um, people wanna hear about what's going on in Iran and how they can as an organization, as an individual, as an institution, help Iranians on the ground uh, fight for their rights. That's good to know as, as a kind of an answer to, to those who are worried about their hijabs outside of Iran is I think it's kind of, I don't know, maybe you will bring the example of Fatima Sepehri. She is the one who is one of the people who is probably one of the forerunners of this movement and she is in jail. So, and she she wears full hijab. So I don't think that kind of, um, you know, those types of concerns are really, um, I mean, any type of concern is valid. Concerns are always valid, especially when they come from the younger generation. Uh, but um, well, I mean, Fatima Sebehi is one of those people full hijab and she's in jail suffering right now. We're not, we have no clue what uh, the regime is doing to her. Um, so th that's, that's great. I, I actually for the petition that you were mentioning, the last time I checked 500,000 people almost had signed the petition and, uh, and that, you know, considering the fact that this the people uh, in Iran, they need the VPN, they don't have good internet. There's almost, it's almost impossible to have a conversation with them right now on the phone because it's kind of, it gets disconnected every, after a few minutes, whether it's on WhatsApp, FaceTime, because the internet is so, so weak, but um, still. Well, I would add the one other thing I, just as a, as a caution, um, because of what you're saying, um, particularly us, uh, people have resorted to using their landlines um, and they're not, to the extent to it's it's been surprising, I think, to numerous people in in particularly in technology, um, that landlines are also being disrupted. That uh, I think um, somebody told me not since the '80s, the end of the Iran Iraq War, have they had to use a landline. Um, and and one person, uh, she ended up calling her mom like five times over and over because a man kept answering the phone, and she was like, "There's no man in my mom's house." Um, and she had, and, and, you know, all the sort of the jokes we could make about that aside, uh, that it did take more than five calls and some, and, and the, the person who, the, the man who was answering was kind of like, why are you calling this person? Um, so it became a point of interrogation by pho landline phone. And, um, and yes, so I would add that. So it, it is a, a VPN and internet, um, but also, a, a increasingly a landline issue where um, I have, I think, a couple of people now who've told me they've had uh, broken landlines. And, and we are going through that with our family uh, as well. So the landline is not working. But also because you were talking about how uh, unsafe it is for protesters to come and speak, that also kind of it goes back to my introduction when you know the, uh, the narrative uh, or whoever speaks right now openly from Iran is usually the people who are part of part of the establishment, such as Mohammad Marandi, who was on CNN the other day, and you know smirking and uh, kind of laughing it off with uh, Christiana Mongkor, and that was, and I think one way to do it is at least because the Iranian protesters are not 
uh, able to speak because it's their life and livelihood. And, you know, uh, we know what's going to happen. Um, the, the media shouldn't give uh, any space to the people who represent the regime, but that's me. So I'm going to end it here and I'm going to ask you th this question. There is one question and all the panelists are, you know, whoever wants to answer this, you're more than welcome. It says Iran's abuses are a transnational phenomenon in the region, as Hog is asking this question, through funded proxies. What can regional neighbors do to amplify the voices of Iranian women to free all from the intersections of IRGC hegemony? <laughs> who wants to answer? Who wants to go? Munir, would you like to answer or? This is, I, I'm sure we, we have something. I, I think mine is large. I'm going to just confine mine to uh, right technology. I talked about sort of the meshes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really not a tech person at all. So I should sort of say that if we get too deep into the tech questions, I, I will, uh, I'm telling you, I don't know too much. I'm a bit of a luddite, but uh, I do think very much this idea of being able to set up um, these mesh networks where when a full block is not happening that Iranians can access, right? I do think that the, that the software, the hardware, and the services that are being allowed through D2 licensing, because I know that sometimes uh, individuals will just wait, wait and wait hours in order to get sort of a moment to get through. So if there is cloud storage, that is their mechanism to get things through. I mean, I get messages in the middle of the night, they wait until, or sometimes they wake me up, but uh, so some of these things are really important. Um, I do think it is very much, uh, you know, everyone has it, it otherwise stressed the importance that this is an, an Iran movement, that there shouldn't be interference or an intervention aside from these, right? These very big tech um, kind of helps legal um, maneuverings um, and I do think that the the pressure on the, there's been no, I, I can't remember if I clarified, there's been no action by the United Nations Human Rights Council, none yeah. whatsoever. Um, so one organ is, so even though there have been statements, even though um, Secretary General made an obligatory statement, um, the Human Rights Council has not done anything, nothing. Um, and that is one mechanism to move things on the internet. There's not been a single resolution, there's not an emergency session, and there has not been a commission of inquiry. Those are three big things um, that the Human Rights Council could be doing, not a single one. Um, and I think that's why uh, sort of the work that I talked about country by country is very helpful, um, because if you're not, uh, because of the political nature of many of these uh, international organizations, um, particularly the United Nations, uh, the country by country ones are very important to help sustain technology, sending the message about um, political leadership um, and, and sort of what the individual countries can do. So that's sort of my answer, just to recap in case. When you were in Hamida, you have an answer about how the, um... You know, oh, okay, so how um, our neighbors, our um, regional neighbors can help with this movement? Because Nada, I don't think we've heard anything from, I mean, the people on the streets, women specifically, have been in support of Iranians. From Pakistan to Turkey, we know that they have been uh, supporting this movement and they're- you know, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, One of my friends is from Afghanistan and he saw me yesterday and said, oh, Muhiru. You are saving the world. <laughs> I say, what? He say, you know, if any kind of change happened to your country, it would be helpful for all of us. And when I say that it is renaissance, I don't mean that it is only belong to Iranian. I say Persian empire. Persian empire was very bigger than this map that we saw, a small cat. It was Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, a part of Turkey, and a lot of land. So we have something in common. And I think with all limitation that Afghanistani women have, they help a lot. 
even more than the Turkish. They put themselves in the danger and went to the street and uh, shutting in front of the Iranian embassy. We are sister. We are not separated from each other. Those who wanted us to be separate and wanted us to be proud of our local culture, those are defeated and it is done. I think not only those women or girls in the Middle East, even my American friends, European friends, with this demonstration, they, they think more, more and more, and they, thought, they, they think about their life, their situation, and they find many different uh, shortage in their life. So it's a uprising, woman uprising all around the world. And all of us are responsible, every of us, single by single. It is since 45 years ago. Oh my God, I don't want to talk about my family, but since it's really 40 years ago that they rooted up our, 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 our home. I promised to myself that I, I won't stop and I would be on a street with people every second whenever they wanted. I would be their voice. And I think all of us are responsible toward what happened to that country. What happened to Ukrainian passenger? What happened to these girls that are right now on the street? They wanted to divide us, separate us from each other and say, oh no, this is because America or Israel, whatever, no, they are not guilty. Enough is enough. Our leaders are thief, our leaders are murderers, our leaders are criminal, and not only our country. Look at Ashraf Ghani, he escaped from country with so many package of, uh, money, do dollars, how many dollars? One, two, three million dollars. They didn't spend it for people. Then I want to say that I don't like to blame anybody, any foreigner country. No, it is a, it is a idioms, Kerm Astani direct. <laughs> you can say warm in his, <laughs> in, in his tree, you know, in a tree. If you can, you can help me then. Okay, sure, sure. It's, uh, it's the, the warm is from within the, yeah. the, the trunk of the tree. The warm the, within the trunk of the tree. You know, and, then, and then I always tell to my student that please, please don't forget, write it down, write it down, write your memory. You know, when I talk about these three books, imagine if there was not Perdosi or Hafez or Haya. This is, this is why they attack the literature. This is why they attack educational system. Put all writers, poets, painter in the jail. So don't forget writing. And I have a suggestion. If any of us, every of us, put, take one, one, one girl and follow her life, and read and write about her life. Imagine what would happen. We had Nezare Mahshar. Mm -hmm. Now, after three years, I, I told my friend about no, Nezare Mahshar. He, he said, what? What was that? I said, really? They put a lot of people there. They killed many people there. We have to write a story about this. Because when news turn to art, then that is it. But if it stay as a news, you forget it. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Munir. There's a question for you. This is for Ms. Ravonipur. Does she see this movement in essence as an a, a, a theory woman as described in Persian stories movement, or is it from the opposite angle as a materialistic women movement? Uh, yes, Jen, uh, sorry. I just wanted to put a very short comment about for the sure. truth. Yes, of yes, course, yes. of course, help me, Hamid. Very, I need not, your help. <laughs> not this one, the previous one. <laughs> Hamid, so go I, ahead, please. By all means, please go ahead. Uh, I just want to mention that it has already been uh, managed to be, uh, you know, making some connection between uh, feminist activists in the uh, area. I mean, uh, we, ha we have the movement Feminists for Gina and um, uh, also Gina movements that has been uh, organized but so by so many uh, feminists across the neighbor and uh, I mean the Middle Eastian area, and has been supported by, um, and uh, you know, very known feminists, and they are trying. I think one important action that has been already taken is uh, the fact that we are trying to, uh, as uh, Monira Jun and Yasa as is uh, mentioned, uh, we are trying to actually. Um, um, register the storytellers, you know, the, the story of the storytellers. And um, even those who cannot, uh, you know, be uh, shown on, uh, you know, media or through the social media, we try to do the interview and, uh, you know, uh, register their uh, story, which is very important in, uh, you know, um, as we know that our story is making the history. So, um, uh, and also, uh, the feminist activists uh, also in the West uh, tr trying to make uh, so many deep connection with the uh, uh, Iranian feminists and also uh, Afghanist feminists and they are trying to um, be our voice you know because uh, as you know they have uh, most of the time they have a more or bigger platform uh, also in the uh, last uh, demonstration or protest that uh, women, Italian women had in uh, Italy um, against the, the, the abortion law, they actually uh, took the, uh, the demand of Iranian women and they tried to uh, be our voices and uh, telling, uh, you know, what's happening in Iran. And, uh, and you know, there is a, there is a very nice, uh, let's say, sisterhood happening uh, between women around the world. And they are very sure, and we all are agree that if, this women's movement in, in Iran will affect all women's situation around the world. As uh, Mona Tahavi uh, wrote that um, um, we have to, we need to go to our own country and see who are our uh, morality polices, you know, uh, because this, this women's movement is uh, actually let's say questioning and uh, uh, putting in the place or challenging the patriarchal system in the whole and not just you know about the um, women's situation in Iran but you know more than that and I think with the we came to the point that with the help of each other I mean women from all over the board, not just the neighbor, but also Western women, we can do, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we can actually challenge the world or, or the power system, which is um, uh, actually riding by a man, powerful man. So I think the, the things that we are witnessing, it's very um, uh, also, I, I mean, it's, painful in some hand, you know, in one hand because of the, uh, you know, situation that women are going through in the Middle East, especially, but in another hand is very beautiful because women are trying to know and recognize about how much power they, they have 
to change their own situation just by come together and you know uh, uh, participate and uh, try to uh, actually uh, collaborate you know uh, in uh, you know in, in this kind of situation together and I, I think it's already been um, so many things has already been happening and uh, I believe that it's gonna get better and better and uh, I hope for the very bright future for not just Middle Eastern women, but for women in general. I agree with you. That um, okay, I, I have, I, I want to wish us about Hazrat Khadijah. We connect to each other, all countries in Middle East, all around the world. You know, she was 40, I think she was, she was 45 or 40 when she met the Prophet Prophet was 25 years old. He was young, he was not famous, nobody knows him, he was not from a big family, but this lady, respectful lady, she had money, she had power, she had a great family. And she fell in love with this man, with Prophet, okay, later Prophet. Then she had a right to fall in love. She, she could meet someone. She could connect it to a man. Then we, I don't know, I don't know really a movement. It, this movement without Khadija would be nothing. Where is the right of our women? Where is the right of our us? Who changed all these rules? Number two. Maryam Majdaliye, Mari. He was one of the closest, closest person friend to Jesus. She wrote, she wrote one of the books, holy books. And you know what? They got her book and just give, the, give her the title of prostitute that quit and convert to the Jesus, convert to the Christianity. And they publish her book under the, another name, a man. You know, this is not new really. This, this, what happened to us is not new. It is from thousands and thousands of years ago. So we, ha we have, a, we have a, a huge responsibility. Even we can't, we can't really waste one minute if we want to solve the problem. Thank you. I think that was that was a good. I, I yes, I agree with you. I don't, I don't want to say that was a good conclusion, but still, we still have time and we still have questions. Neda John, you you wanted to share with us something because. Uh, you said something about Rutgers. Is there is there a panel that we we? Ah, so we do have a panel uh, that is planned for November tenth. Um, so if you are interested, so uh, I think if you have been reading about the Iran protests um, or following some of the media on it, um, Professor uh, Fatima Shams, is, uh, who does literature, but also was. Uh, has largely been uh, in exile since 2009 uh, and the Green Movement. So she is going, she is one of our panelists. Uh, if you are interested in the, the legal side of things, um, we do, I, I haven't fully confirmed. Um, so we do have a special advisor. Uh, I have invited a, a special advisor um, to the United Nations on gender persecution and gender justice. Um, to join us, uh, as well as uh, in if that person does not work out, um, we're trying to figure out scheduling. Um, we have uh, an expert on world the World Trade Organization um, and how Iran fits into uh, international trade and particularly sanctions and other laws that might be applicable. So I see that there are some questions um, about what the United Nations can do. What is the U.S. government supposed to do if not interfere? Um, I think on the latter one, I've, I've kind of said the, the technology is very important. 
um, and, and the general licenses are very important. Um, but uh, our, so I've, uh, in terms of if you're interested in legal questions um, or some technology questions, both on the, all on the international level, um, one of two of those uh, people will be there in addition to um, Fatima Shams and um, myself. And that is November 10th. It'll be in the afternoon. I don't have a confirmed date for you, but uh, if you are interested, um, you know, I can send that out. Uh, the other thing I did want to clarify just a little bit um, when I was talking about hijab and choice is uh, I think there's a response within some parts of the Muslim as well as Iranian communities about choice and inclusion. Um, and that's all I'm saying is that some people uh, who make the choice uh, to participate and, and wear that also want to protest. Um, I'm not, uh, and particularly uh, at my university, um, that has become an issue um, that you can simultaneously choose to support women, be a woman, um, and, and participate in a religion. Um, and, and so I think that uh, when we talk about activists, I was just pointing out, at least on my campus, um, that there is those uh, inclusivity measures um, that women also want. Not about Sepedi or people in Iran um, or anything along those lines. Um, so yeah, just to follow up on those two things about a panel and um, clarify what I was saying. That's awesome, thank you so much. And I think D uh, Dylan, you might wanna stop the recording or um, let me thank everybody for showing up. Moniru, Hamide, Neda, thank you so much thank for you. your input. This was an awesome um, panel. I learned so much and it was great to hear your, um, your talks and listen to you uh, discuss this issue, this urgent issue so beautifully and so vastly. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, um, we learned a lot and I think this is, this is somehow gave us some uh, kind of uh, incentive to continue the momentum and make sure that we are part of this movement and do not just forget about it or stay on the sidelines and just observe it. We, uh, I personally will make sure that I work as hard as I can in order to support uh, the young people on the streets in Iran. And it's not just the young people, I shouldn't even just say young, everybody's there, uh, the Iranian, um, the doctors in, in Mashhad yesterday started to uh, join uh, the movement. The strikes have been happening and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see this uh, kind of, um, um, the, the kind of um, the call for justice, the call for social justice that has been uh, for so long has been uh, has been for so long dormant um, is now kind of calling the world to to kind of look at Iran to kind of help Iran and uh, to cheer Iranians for what they truly deserve and that is dignity, um, humanity, and freedom. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you, Yas. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Good. See ya.